Um, so, co brief comment to start. Maybe keep your questions until the end. We quite have quite a few slides to run through, so um, any questions, comments, we'll have a discussion at the end. I'm Paul. Um, somewhere around me, you can probably see Marco, and uh, there are many other people involved as well, as you can see on the slide, and we're here to give you a status report on broken dependency orderings in the Linux kernel. But before we talk about anything that might or might not be broken, let's quickly set the stage as to what this quote-unquote fear is of broken dependencies. So the Linux kernel, it is written in C, but it's written not in standard C, but it's sort of written in its own dialect of C. You might call it Linux C. And Linux C has its own memory model. It's called the memory, the Linux kernel memory consistency model, or LKMM, LKMM short. And C11 has its own memory consistency model, the C11 memory, C11 memory model. <laughs> and it's, um, they are very similar, but differ in subtle ways. And the thing is that compilers, they are C compilers. They're not Linux C compilers, but they're just C compilers. So what they, they think in terms of the C11 memory model and not the Linux kernel memory model. And what people have become increasingly afraid of now with, with compilers becoming ever, ever sort of stronger and smarter is that they might introduce optimizations which transform code in a way where at runtime weekly ordered architectures could reorder it in a way which the memory consist the Linux kernel memory consistency model doesn't predict. Right? So a memory model always it gives us guiding principles as to, and, um, to the order in which accesses to shared memory appear to other threads or might be observed by other threads. And if at runtime, all of a sudden, this ordering doesn't align with the prediction anymore, well, bad things happen. Let me introduce you to um, three actors for today's talk. We have informal tux. Um, who you can identify by its whole tie. And it rep um, he represents the formal Linux kernel memory model. We have regular tux or informal tux who represents the idea of memory ordering which advanced programmers will have in their head. So it's kind of an informal memory model. It isn't written down anywhere, but it's obvious to, um, to programmers who know how code will get optimized and will end up in the architecture. And then we have the dragon who's sort of re representative of compilers in general. <laughs> this problem of broken dependencies, it isn't, it isn't you. As I mentioned, it's sort of this, this fear. And um, Will Deacon has discussed this at the last two Linux Promise conferences. And it has led to various mega threads on the Linux kernel mailing list. And as a certain someone has also pointed out, all of those discussions are kind of pointless if we don't have real evidence of these dependency orderings being broken. So what we require is evidence. What we, were, what we require is the Linux kernel memory model dependency checker. And such a dependency checker, it should be able to annotate dependencies according to the Linux kernel memory model. In this case, that would be address and control dependencies. These are the kinds of dependencies people are worried about. And it should be able to check as part of compilation, whether these dependencies are being respected by compiler optimizations. The dependency checker should also be able to do or perform interprocedural analysis. So these dependencies, address and control dependencies, they can run across functions. So um, the tool should be able to account for that. And because, well, this is a requir requirement we have, it's uh, because LLVM is pretty cool, it um, relies on Clang Build Linux and should be implemented as part of the Clang compiler. This is basically where I come in the picture. So Marco realized that this is a problem and we require evidence and thought that this would be a great idea to outsource this into a thesis project at the university. And I'm, I had to do my bachelor's thesis and I reached out to the chair of Pramod who was in contact with Marco. And then I got to do my bachelor's thesis on the dependency checker basically. So all the work you're going to see today, I laid the foundation in my bachelor's thesis and then I continued wo working on it afterwards basically. And what we came up with is the following. So you have the Clang compiler and it has a front end and the front end will perform some wizardry and eventually you end up with unoptimized LLVM intermediate representation or IR in short. This IR will then be fed into hundreds of compiler passes. 
one of the first ones should be the annotation pass. And the annotation pass should look at this unoptimized IR and then annotate all of the address and control dependencies it can find and then let all of the other compiler optimizations perform their magic and eventually there will be a second pass, the verification pass, which will look at the annotations the first pass made and then determine whether compiler optimizations transformed code in a way where with the audit architectures at runtime can reorder it in a way the Linux kernel memory model doesn't predict. And this optimized IR then eventually gets fed into the back end, it will be optimized further, lowered down to assembly, yada, yada, yada. For such a design to work, we require an unambiguous, an unambiguous and implementable definition of what these address and control dependencies actually are. So let's talk about address dependencies and how they might be broken. If you have a look at the tools memory model explanation.txt, you'll see that there is a definition for an address dependency and it says a read event and, a, and another memory access event are linked by an address dependency if the value obtained by the read affects the location accessed by the other event. This poses the existence of three components. You have, so you are looking for the first marked access. It has to be a read. So you're looking for a read once. You're looking for a dependency chain. And then you're looking for another marked access, which could be a read or a write, which either read from or write to a value which is part of this dependency chain starting at the first read once. So you have the read once here. It loads into X. Then you use X as the base point of an array. You load into bar. And then you use bar in another read one. So you read from an address in bar and then load that into Y. So the dependency chain in this case is the second read ones, bar to X to the first read ones. So in this case, there is an address dependency. And in this case, the Linux kernel memory model predicts ordering. But what about this? Is this an address dependency? Formal tux says no. And the reason is, this is a syntactic dependency. If you have a look at the array, you realize that the array is of length one. And compilers want to avoid undefined behavior or assume you, the programmer, didn't introduce undefined behavior. So they'll figure out that the second read once reads from array, an array is size one. So the only legal index in this case is zero. And compilers can replace x with zero, which is totally fine, except for the fact that it breaks the dependency chain. So now there is no dependency chain from the second read ones to the first read ones, <laughs> because this existed through the x. Um, but now this got removed. And the Linux kernel memory model accounts for that, because it says, well, at runtime, there won't be a dependency chain. So there wasn't an address dependency in the first place. The semantics of the code do not suggest a dependency. It's only the syntax. Address dependencies can be broken. And as I mentioned, there are three components. And um, we can break them, first of all, by introducing a second, so another path for control flow where this dependency chain doesn't exist. So the, the original dependency chain still exists, but now there's another path control flow can take where the dependency chain does not exist. This might look something like this. So on the left, you have, again, the simple example I gave you before, address dependency. On the bottom, you can see the control flow graphs for the left and the right piece of code. And on the right, you can see a, well, all of this is artificial, obviously, but an, art of, an, an optimized version of this artificial example where, um, for whatever reason, the compiler might determine that it makes sense to uh, compare X to Baz. And then if this is true, use Baz as the base pointer for the array instead of X. And again, this is a totally, might be totally legit move, but the problem is again, now the dependency chain is broken because Baz does not depend on the read ones. X does, but Baz doesn't. So now there's a way for control flow to avoid the dependency and this to be reordered at runtime, as Will Deacon pointed out in his talk where this example is from. There's another and maybe simpler way of breaking address dependencies where you just break the dependency chain altogether. So you, you keep the first marked access, you keep the second marked access, but now there is no dependency chain between the two. 
which leads us finally to real Linux kernel code. This is an example that was found by the LKMM dependency checker. And as you might remember, I mentioned interprocedural analysis. In this case, you cannot directly see the read ones and the write ones, yes, <laughs> because they, they lie several functions deep. So in the beginning, you have this call to page stable node. And then I, if I remember correctly, it calls several, I think two or three functions, whatever. And then eventually it reaches a read once. Then the last function returns a value which depends on that read once. The function which was called previously returns a value which depends on the return value of the last called function which depends on the read once, yada, yada, yada. Eventually, page stable node returns a value which depends on the read once, which gets assigned into stable node. Stable node then is used in a condition, and if this condition is true, you, there's more unrelated stuff happening, and eventually you assign the address of migrate nodes into stable node head, and then there's a call from into list add where um, you pass stable node head as the second function argument. Again, there are several function calls, and eventually you write, there's a write once to an address which through a dependency chain depends on the second function argument to list add which depends on stable node, which depends on the return value of page stable node, which eventually depends on the read once. So that's why there's an address dependency here, and it's interprocedural because it extends through several function calls. Now what might happen is the following. Um, in the, at the bottom, you can see the optimized version of this code. It's reverse engineered from optimized LLVM IR, and it's identical to the one on the top, except for the fact that you're now missing the assignment of, my, of the address of migrate nodes into stable node head. Why are we missing this assignment? Well, the compiler figured out that list add uses stable node head as the second function argument, and um, stable node head gets defined in the line before. It is the address of migrate nodes. So what the compiler does, it just replaces stable node head with the address of migrate nodes. It just saves the assignment, which is totally fair, but it breaks the dependency chain. So this is a great example to illustrate how the dependency chains might be broken, but the Linux kernel got lucky in this case um, because all of this was predicted by a lock-unlock, so it's easy to reason that no other thread would be accessing this at the same time and would be able to observe these accesses happening out of order, but nevertheless, it sort of shows how these optimizations might happen. Here's a second example. So you have an RCUD reference call. Again, it boils down to a read once. The return value of this RCUD reference gets loaded into delegation. Delegation then gets used in another if condition, and eventually there is a for loop which uses, uh, which assigns the return value of list entry RCU into delegation and then list entry RCU receives delegation, which then might, de or which depends on that first RCU de reference assignment into delegation. So there's an address dependency here through that dependency chain from delegation into list entry RCU. Again, here's the reverse engineered optimized LLVM IR. And as you can see, the compiler introduced a new variable for the sake of argument, let's call it compare. And now the compiler is loading RCU de reference into compare. Compare is then being used in an if condition, and it's being used in another if condition. And then you have the assignment into delegation. But now you're assigning placeholder deleg, which does not depend on the return value of the RCU de reference. And why are we assigning from placeholder deleg? Well, in the if condition, we figured out that com compare and placeholder deleg are equal, because the only way we can reach that assignment is is if the if condition returns true, and it returns true exactly when compare and placeholder delig are the same value, so those two are interchangeable. So the compi compiler can assign placeholder delig into delegation, which is fair, but it breaks the dependency chain. So this is a real bug, and it hasn't been fixed, which is my fault, sorry. <laughs> I will fix it hopefully very soon. Um, and this, actually has been pointed out in documentation that you're not supposed to use RCUD reference values in if conditions, but still it shows how, um, again, compiler optimizations might, might break address dependencies. 
Remember the initial oh. challenge I talked about? We require an unambiguous and implementable def uh, definition. One uh, yes. uh, clarification on the on the thing about uh, about not using uh, RC to reference values near speakers where you're getting feedback. Um, the uh, it's okay if and only if the thing you're comparing against uh, has constant values like a compile time or long enough ago that the that the changes have to be visible everywhere. Right, as I think that's even pointed out in documentation. Yeah, I just wanted to yeah. clarify that it wasn't, a, 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 but anyway, you're better off just not doing it at all. You're right about that. Okay, so there's the challenge for, un, for an, the requirement of an unambiguous and implementable dependency definition. And I showed you address dependencies and you could argue it's fairly straightforward. You, okay, you have the first read ones, you have the dependency chain, and then you have the read or write ones. Okay, fair enough. But what about control dependencies? So let's have a look at control dependencies and how we, or how they might be broken. Again, we can consult tools, memory model, documentation, explanation, or text. And there, there you will not find this definition, but you will in a few weeks. And it says, finally, a read once x and a write one, write event y, a linked by a control dependency. If y syntactically lies within an arm of an if statement, and X affects the evaluation of the if condition via a data or address dependency, or similarly for a switch statement. Quite a mouthful, so let's have a look at a real example, or oh, well, no, artificially, artificial real example, <laughs> where, again, we're looking for a read once, and we're looking for a dependency chain, but this time the dependency chain should run into some kind of condition, if or switch. And then you're looking for a write once, not read once, it has to be a write once, in either of the arms of that if. So in this case, and there's no requirement that this write once has to depend, or has, has, has to write to an address which is part of the dependency chain, just could be any write once. But the requirement is that it has to syntactically lie within the arm of one of, uh, within one of the two arms of the if, so either in the if arm or in the else arm. In this case, we have the read once, it loads into X, and then X is being used in the if condition, so there's the dependency chain. And then you have the write once, which syntactically lies within the arm of this if, and therefore you have a control dependencies, as formal tux points out here. But what about this? Again, we have a read once in an if condition. This is bad coding style, but never mind that for now. You have, if this, if condition goes to true, you return four, and otherwise you just continue. There's a write once, and then you return two. Might be easy to reason that this isn't a control dependency because the write once doesn't syntactically lie within the arm of an if whose condition is affected by a read once either via a data or address dependency. But the problem is you can rewrite this code in such a way where you just negate the if condition and now all of a sudden the write once does appear in the, syntactically appear in the arm of an if whose condition is affected by a read once either via a data or address dependency. And formal tux says no in the first case. So it doesn't see the control dependency, but it does, it does see the control dependency in the rewritten example, so this one. But informal tux, says yes. And why does informal tux say, say, say yes? Well, the code I just showed you, the two code snippets, they're equivalent. As is also exemplified by the fact that they have the same control flow graph. Now there are two things to point out here. First of all, this is a known limitation of the formal Linux kernel memory model. There are just certain obvious cases it doesn't catch, and you can read up on that on the Linux kernel mailing list. And the second thing is, we wouldn't be able, so even if this definition were perfectly correct, our tool wouldn't be able to use it because there's no way for us to tell these examples apart. So the formal Linux kernel memory model in one case says yes, in the other case, case says no, but to our tool, which is performing static analysis in the control flow graph, it just sees the same control flow graph for both of these examples. So even if we wanted to use this definition, we can't. So we would require a different one. Well, yes, the answer has to be yes. We want to match informal tux in this case, but we require a different definition. This is sort of the classical definition of control dependencies, um, which is used in static analysis. And 
I'm not going to read it out to you because it is fairly, um, it is quite dense. As you can see, there's an if with two, with two ifs, so that already means trouble. And it de depends on something called post-dominance, which has even more capital letters and is very complicated. So let's have a look at a practical example again. This classical definition of control dependence is defined on the control flow graph. So it does not care about read once, it does not care about write once, it does not care about ordering at runtime, it does not care about the Linux kernel memory model or bow tie wearing penguins, it only cares about the control flow graph. And we can just pick two nodes in here and now ask whether, the, whether one is control dependent on the other. And to figure that out, we need to answer the question whether one post dominates the other. And in this case, the second one does post dominate the first one. And why is that the case? Well, post, dominate, post dominance, you ask when control flow reaches the first node, and I want to go from the first node to the function return, so to the end, so to speak, of the, of the control flow graph, whichever way I pick, am I guaranteed to see the second node? If the answer is yes, so no matter which way I take to the function return, and if, uh, no matter which way I take to the function return and I'm going to see the second node, if the answer to that question is yes, then um, there is post-dominance and therefore there is no control dependency. So in this case, there is post-dominance and there's no control dependency. The dragon agrees. But if you pick these two nodes, now there is a way, so if you reach the first one, the if node, um, if you reach the if node, now there's a way for control flow to avoid reaching the second node by just going through the then and then more code and then exit. And now there is the case where you reach the if, but you didn't see the else. So therefore else does not post dominate if, therefore there is a control dependency as the, dra the dragon points out here. Again, we can apply this to a simple example and you would ask the question, does the right ones post dominate the if condition? This is sort of a little hand wavy. You can't ask, you can't really, well, this is a little hand wavy, but this is more intuitive. So you just ask whether the right ones post dominates the if condition. And the answer to that question is no, because when you reach the if condition, you can just avoid the right ones by going to return true immediately when the if condition is false. Um, so in that case, uh, you would be able to figure out that there is a control dependency here. But what about this case? You have the loop marker, and then again, you're using read once in an if condition, and then you have a write once, and the return, if the if condition is true, and if it, the if condition is false, you just loop around again. If you look at the control flow graph on the right, you'll notice that the write and the exit are in the same basic block or a control flow graph node. So if you take this a step further and you start thinking about post-dominance, whichever node you pick in the control flow graph and you ask whether it's post whether the right post dominates that other node you picked, then you'll realize that you're asking the question whether if I reach the function return, am I reaching the right ones? And this is trivially true because the right ones and the function return lie in the same basic block. So when I reach well, one of them I'm going to reach the other. So post-dominance post will trivially be true in this case. So the dragon will say there is no control dependency here. However, the right ones does syntactically lie within the arm of an if whose condition is affected by a read once either via a data or address dependency. So formal tux says there is a control dependency here. So what is it? But the answer has to be yes, because we want to match what Linux says, obviously. Again, we want to, we're thinking about in terms of the Linux kernel memory consistency model, so we want the answer to be yes. And as a result, the classical control dependency definition doesn't work for our intents and purposes. Now you might say, well, can't you just sort of transform the control flow graph in a way where the right ones and the function return don't lie in the same basic block? I would say, well, yes, maybe, but this was, this example was derived from optimized IR again. So my, the dependency checker encountered a case where the right ones and the function return were in the same basic block. And this ambiguity of control dependencies is by design. The 
classical definition and the Linux Pino memory model definition, they just have different goals. As I said, the classical definition, it doesn't, it's defined on the control flow graph and the Linux Pino memory model definition, it thinks in terms of runtime and ordering. So it's just the same word for two different things. So we require another definition and here's another try, a work in progress try, which says, there's a control dependency from a marked read A to a marked write B if there is a condition C such that B is within the scope of C and C depends on A. The idea here is again, we have the read once and you track the dependency chain from the read once into an if condition. And now you start tracking the scope of that if condition. The scope in my head is defined by all the paths in the control flow graph starting at this if condition. So you have at least the if and the else path, and then there might be several function calls, there might be a loop, there might be a switch, there might be a go-to, whatever. So these paths, they'll multiply really quickly. And then there might be a point where all of them meet again. That's the point where I, in my head, consider this control dependency resolved, or this, the scope of this condition will then be resolved. But this point doesn't necessarily have to come. So if we think of the example from before again, and look at the control flow graph, there's one path from the condition which goes to the go-to and then just loops around. That path will never meet the one from the function return because the function return path will just return and the other one will just loop around. So I would say this control dependency never gets resolved in this, or, or the condition never gets resolved in this sense. And with this definition, in this case, you would be able to figure out a, uh, that there is a control dependency. But as I mentioned, there's there are loops, there are function calls, there are breaks, there are switches, whatever. There, there's a, there are a lot of edge cases, which is why this is called work in progress. Let's talk about how control dependencies might be broken. You have now have an additional component to the address dependency. You have the read once, you have the dependency chain, you have the if condition, if condition and the write once. So what you can do, as with the address dependency, you can just break the dependency chain. That will break, that will break ordering. But what you can also do is now you can do something with the condition and the right ones within this condition. So let's have a look at this example. Is this a control dependency? Compiler would be well within its rights to perform such an optimization where the branch gets removed and Formal tux says, well, no, this is not a control dependency. It's syntactic because the if condition is trivially true. So the compiler can just remove it. And the semantics of the code do not suggest any kind of dependency here because if the if condition is always true, you can just remove the branch. The dragon in this case gives an even more universal answer than 42. It says it depends. And what does it depend on? Well, it depends on when you're asking this question. In unoptimized IR, there will still be a branch. So if whatever control dependency definition you use, you will, be figure, you will be able to figure out that there's a branch, and then you might be able to deduce that there is a control dependency. But if you're looking at optimized IR, so by then the compiler would have already deduced that the if condition is trivially true, there will be no branch. So the answer is it depends. It depends on when you're asking this question. Is this a control dependency? Actually, there are several control dependencies here because we have two right ones which are not identical and two different branches and both of them fulfill the requirement that they syntactically lie within the arm of an if whose condition is affected either by, a, by the read once through a address or data bit dependency. So there are, several, um, there are several control dependencies here. But the dragon says again, it depends. And what does it depend on? Well, it depends on the architecture you're compiling for because Will Deacon argues that all of these right ones might be lumped together into one conditional switch, uh, conditional um, select. select statement, thank you, <laughs> um, um, which will then break, that there will be no branch and which will then break the control dependency in this case. So now it's, you're not talking about IR anymore, you're talking about assembly. So in this case, it, it's the back end which is breaking the um, is breaking the control dependency. So where does all of this leave us? I would argue we are past the point where 
we are asking the question whether this is a problem because I gave you two examples. Well, two isn't much, but still, it's like real world evidence of things going wrong. So the question we are looking at now is to what extent a compiler is undermining the Linux kernel memory model. And for that, we have the LKMM dependency checker, which is at the moment, it's capable of doing addressing control dependencies, albeit the control dependency part is still a work in progress. The address dependency checker will hopefully end up in an IFC to LLVM very, very soon. And again, we're a work in progress on the control dependency part. A tool like this, I'm afraid, doesn't come without a set of limitations. I mentioned syntactic dependencies. And the problem with syntactic dependencies is that they don't necessarily imply semantic dependencies. So there is quite a potential for false positives here where the syntactic dependencies I showed you, you wouldn't be able, just by looking at the code you, and, well, statically looking at the code, you wouldn't be able to figure out that the if condition, for example, was trivially true. There's the problem of computational feasibility where you might have an address dependency running through a million function calls. Well, is it feasible to follow them? No. Is it theoretically possible? Yes. But yes, it's a limitation. Just as um, loops are, where our analysis at the moment is avoiding back edges, but of course, ideally, you want to handle loops because you have a loop condition. There might be control dependencies there. And there's also front ends and back ends. So we implicitly just assume that the front end will produce unoptimized LLVMIR, where no dependency has been transformed in a way where it doesn't isn't in accordance with the Linux kernel memory model anymore. And we just make this assumption. And at the moment, we only have two passes. And well, the second pass runs before the back end. And as I showed you with the control dependency example, the back end might be performing, performing harmful optimizations as well. So it would be really interesting to actually have a third or a fourth pass, which look, then looks at the back end or front end respect, respectively to sort of make this. Um, yeah, make this analysis more extensive. The hunt for broken dependencies is open, and we have a few future plans which we are, uh, which we want to follow. We have want to continue building various diff configs of various Linux kernel flavors to just sort of continue finding um, these cases I showed you before, because there's there are no concrete assumptions we can make as to where these broken dependencies are. We want to do some random testing where we just generate random but relevant Linux kernel configs and then have a look at or have it they then have the dependency checker look at those randomly generated configs. Um, we, we want to submit LLVM IFC so eventually get this upstream somehow. And what would also be interesting as uh, Will Deacon and Paul McKinney agreed would be to have a look um, at transformations from one kind of dependency into another. So maybe a control dependency gets transformed into an address dependency where the branch gets removed, but ordering doesn't. So there's no branch, but there's still ordering because now there's a dependency chain from the read ones to the write ones. Or maybe a control dependency gets strengthened where you now have a control dependency and an address dependency at the same time. We would like to extend our analysis to the back end, as I mentioned, because things can, might be going wrong there as well. And we would like to get the ball rolling on short-term and long-term fixes. So I guess you have way more input than that than me. And if you think this is um, quite interesting, as I do, um, compilers are cool, Linux kernel is cool, memory models are cool, you can get in touch with the links below. And now I'm looking forward to all of your questions, feedback, discussion, whatever. And I have a few, I will throw up some points here and now you can tell me why all of those won't work. And it's, Looking forward. Thank you. Questions for Paul? Comments? Thoughts? Hi, Paul. Um, so what's, what's the plan for LTO? I see in some previous slides that you said you say you have a plan, future plan for it. Yes, well, we, at the moment, I'm not just, I'm just not building with LTO, but that would, of course, be very interesting because we will have, um, yeah, wider ranging optimizations onto the futures. And could you, the previous, the, those uh, phases, 
Yeah. So uh, you are the annotation pass and the verification pass in the beginning and the end of the optimization phases. So these two passes only can so detect whether the compiler optimization breaks the dependency chain or not, right? It's, it cannot guide whether how the compiler avoid this kind of problem. Um, well, it, that's something that would be interesting too, where um, if, if the tool would be able, so it can concretely figure out what gets broken and then based on that suggest fixes to the user or just mm -hmm. go ahead and fixes it itself. There's a simple way of doing that where you just have the tool insert a barrier instruction, then at the cost of you just constrain reordering completely, mm -hmm. which comes at a performance cost, but then you know things won't go wrong. Or yeah, you just give some output to the user where the minimal output would be, okay, a dependency chain gets broken, it's up to you to figure out where, and then you'd have the tool maybe give some sort of minimal IR example, mm -hmm. or it could give you like completely like, okay, here's an if condition got introduced somewhere here, and that's what's breaking ordering, whatever. So, so, the output, so if the uh, verification pass identifies some dependency chain is broken, then this tool will report some information to the user to add some barrier in the source code. Yes. Oh. I mean, I, I see three use cases for this. Um, there's the first use case is for Linux kernel memory model maintainers where hopefully the tool we will be in a form where they can use it to answer the question to what extent are compilers undermining the Linux kernel memory mm. model. There's the second use case where Linux kernel conscious compiler engineers can use this to check whether their optimizations mm -hmm. are respecting the Linux kernel memory yeah. model. And there's the third use case of Linux kernel developers can check whether their code is being respected by current compiler optimizations. Yeah. And for that, for those use cases to work, we, yes, we want to upstream it, but then, as I mentioned, there are limitations and we want to make it usable. So you want to avoid something like false positives. You want to get very useful output. You don't, you can't just be like, hey, oh, there's a broken dependency somewhere in this file. It has 10,000 lines, good luck, sort of. I mean, you can't do that. So we want something usable. Yes. Okay. So sometimes it's not the user's, uh, it's not the program's uh, issue because sometimes the optimization might not, uh, is applied very aggressively, so some optimization need to be disabled. So I think there are some uh, communication between the verification phase and the optimization. Then the optimization, some optimization need to be done uh, less aggressively and uh, then can avoid to uh, broken the dependent chain. So sometimes it's not the user's job to change the code. It's optimization did something too aggressively to broken. Well, um, also, I, 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 uh, I, I think um, turning off this optimization, mm -hmm. you need to have very fine precision in which you turn off the optimization. You programmers, like they really don't want the optimization disabled for the entirety of the yes. of the code base kind of thing. And right now, compilers are unaware of the kernel's memory model requirements. Mm -hmm. And so the first part is to identify and say, you're using a tool chain that's using a different memory model. So you need to put some annotation in your source for now. Mm -hmm. Maybe it collapses, it's a macro and it collapses to nothing once we have a pluggable memory model in the, in the tool chain that mm -hmm. the tool chain's aware of. Yeah, and yeah. so then when you're saying to the tool chain, I would, like, I would like to opt into a different memory model, mm -hmm. then the compiler can hopefully figure out there's a dependency chain, control dependency, el elide or skip this optimization in this one specific case. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so, yeah. One thing that would be a little bit annoying but useful would be to uh, uh, just mark the variables that are car carrying dependencies. That works for address and data things, but uh, we don't know how, we don't have a good proposal for annotating control dependencies as yet. So if somebody has a good idea along those lines, please don't keep it a secret. Well, we had a volatile if proposal. Peter, 
Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you still have something to say, Peter? Or uh, we had the volatile if proposal for having control dependencies. I said a good way. <laughs> well, I, I thought it was pretty okay, but. <laughs> okay, so another question. Uh, can you go back to the slide we were just on now? It's, it's maybe a bit more about the implementation, so we can also take it afterwards. But um, in the annotation pass, you need to identify the read once and write once. Yes. And those are macros, so you don't necessarily see them in the LLVM IR. Do you, um, like, how do you identify them? Or Our assumption is that um, read once and write once just boil down to volatile loads and stores in LLVM IR. And then every time we see a volatile load or store, we think this is a read once or write once, respectively. OK. Thanks. We got a question in the back here. Uh, so you, I mean, for fixing clearly or perhaps adding memory barriers after every, in between every one of these pairs of instructions might not be a good idea, but are there some other typical fixes that are useful or is it really completely specific to each case? You mean whether there's a better way of inserting fixes, basically? If you don't want to add just systematically memory barriers in between yes. these read once and write once operations, is there some other kinds of typical fixes for this problem? Write it in assembly. <laughs> um, I guess the, the, the best way would, as, as Paul said, would be a way to have a mechanism for the programmer to convey intent to the compiler where the programmer can signal I expect there to be a dependency here, and then somehow if the compiler respect that. Because now, I mean, yes, we have different, we have the Linux kernel memory model and all of that, but there might still, you can always say, yes, there's a real dependency being broken here, but I, the programmer, never, I don't care about ordering in this case. So it's still a false positive. So that we would flag, even if the tool would be working perfectly well and catch every case of a broken dependency, you would be outputting that as broken, and then you could just be like, ah, I don't care, still false positive. So I guess uh, the coolest way to fix it would be by conveying intent, but please, uh, other people can probably have, have better. So actually what you should be doing is reporting to the user a patch that puts the barrier in the right place, and they can just not apply it if they feel like it's uh, right. inappropriate. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's more or less the way it's working now, where, where the tool will just be like, hey, uh, we here's something might be broken there. Just have another look. Um, um, could you go to the last slide? Yeah, and so maybe I'm overthinking this, but then if you think about what is expected from the user, you know, as a solution, wouldn't it get complicated very quickly? Because then what kind of annotations are we expecting the user to give? One, for sure, whether it's a control or the, or what was the other one? Um, data dependency. And then on what is a dependency? Is it just the immediate, uh, like the control dependency X on X, but the X itself may have a data dependency on something else. So is it how far, how much of that dependency chain is expected to be conveyed to the compiler? I guess that's that's the tricky part, right? Because yeah. as I mentioned, you, you might have these running several functions deep things, the code changes across versions, the code changes across, um, across kernel conflicts. So even if you were to make annotations in code, maybe they're not universal universally applicable. Yes. So for example, I could just say like, ah, uh, here's an if condition, which is trivially true, but then for not, like the example I gave before, where you have um, the, uh, where max in this case is defined as one, but max might be dependent on the config you're building with. So for another config, this, you could make the annotation, ah, the if condition is trivially true, but that might not apply for another config. So right. that's the problem, yes. Yes. <laughs> 
I think one thing people have sort of indicated is that whether or not something is intended to carry a dependency is um, contextual. Sorry, I'm over here. Um, so, so a function might be used in a lot of contexts where it doesn't matter whether it carries a dependency at all, and we want the compiler to like optimize it away to a constant. It might live in a different compilation unit from where it's being called from. We can't do that global analysis without linked on optimization. Um, so <laughs> how do we deal with that sort of thing? Because, the <laughs> okay, Paul will have an answer in a moment. <laughs> Well, setting aside control dependencies, the proposals have been that you have to mark a variable that carries a dependency, and you also need to mark a parameter that carries a dependency and a return value that carries a dependency. Sure, but I think my point was that there are lots of functions where whether or not you want it to carry that dependency is, a, is, is actually dependent on the caller in a different place, and a lot of the time you won't want it to carry a dependency. You don't uh, care. You've got the same thing with a bunch of other issues too, right? Um, that's a, a common thing. Common code often has to be has to take into account all of its callers, and this would be a case where that might might also apply, right? That's fair. Yeah. Any other questions for Paul? <laughs> uh, that, the speaker. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> okay. Thank you so much for for your talk, Paul. We appreciate that. Thank you.